Well, folks, I think we should get started. Heath and Dr. Bricker, what do you think? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, perfect. Folks, I want to welcome everyone to our Fireside Chat series. Uh, I am Gray Campbell. I work for Six Degrees Health, and I do want to offer a quick little plug. Who are we? Well, we are celebrating our 10-year anniversary. Six Degrees Health is here to serve the healthcare industry. We are a service-first, cost-containment company. For some, we are in the world of breaking you free of the traditional networks. We offer RBP solution, for example. And then for others, we bring integrity to historically opaque billing practices. We leverage, excuse me, we leverage unparalleled clinical ex expertise and innovative data technology to empower employers and their covered employees in realizing the true benefit of healthcare. So welcome from Six Degrees Health. We have been around for 10 years and we're stoked to have you. Today we are offering a chat about high cost medical claimants, strategies for success. We have Dr. Eric Bricker here. But before I introduce Dr. Bricker, I do want to mention to everyone here on the call, we do have the ability for you to ask questions. Look for the Q&A function. It should be on the right lower corner of your screen. Please ask us questions. We love, we thrive on your questions. If you wanna use the chat function, you can chat with each other or chat with us. But if you have questions, I encourage you to go to the Q&A. So what are we doing today? We are focusing on those high cost claimants that are the root causes of problems out there in the industry. Certainly, we look, we're look. we going to look at some revenue strategies and some solutions, things like primary care, direct contracting, and in-network steerage versus plan design. This is stuff that Dr. Eric Bricker knows a lot about. So let's move on to the Dr. Bricker slide. Who is this person, Dr. Bricker? Dr. Bricker is absolutely a hero of mine. Oh, Yes, here we are, Dr. Bricker. So when I was new to the industry a couple of years ago, guess where I found information? I found it on YouTube, right? YouTube has plenty of information and so does Dr. Bricker. He is the chief medical officer of A Healthcare Z, which has produced over 300 healthcare ed educational videos that have been viewed over, I can't believe this, Dr. Bricker, 120,000 times per month, okay? That's per month on LinkedIn and YouTube. He also founded, excuse me, co-founded Compass Professional Health Services. You can learn about that right here. And he is also an internal medicine physician, graduating with honors from the University of Illinois College of Medicine and completed his residency at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Really, really stoked to have you. Welcome, Dr. Bricker. Hey. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. You, you bet. And doctor, before you get started talking about some things, I've got a couple of questions for you, but I do want to introduce a couple of other folks here. We have Heath Potter, our chief growth officer at Six Degrees Health. Howdy to you. Yeah, good to see everybody. Before right on. And then we also have our president, Katie Brandt. Katie is joining us as well because she is quite the expert when it comes to these high cost medical claimants. Welcome, Katie. Thanks, Gray. Thanks for having me. You Good bet. You Bricker. bet. Yes, we are thrilled to have you, Dr. Bricker. I, again, have some questions for you to get things started. Then we'll get into the slideshow. Dr. Bricker, how did you get here? You were a physician, and I really want to hear your origin story. Give me a minute or two of how you got here today. Yes, so um, I'll, I'll keep it brief. First off, thanks so much to Six Degrees Health for having me. It's uh, so nice of you to do this, and thank you all for joining in the, uh, the Fireside chat today uh, as well. Thanks for, thanks for being here and giving us your attention. And so um, in the late 90s, um, you know, they were just giving away jobs. That's when I graduated from college. And I don't have any doctors in my family. And every doctor I talked to said, whatever you do, don't become a doctor, right? Because this is when HMOs were all the rage. And, you know, every doctor I talked to said, you know, HMOs are ruining the practice of medicine. So I said, well, I, you know, I should probably learn about that before I go into medical school to see if this is the right decision since every doctor is telling me not to do it. Um, so I actually became a hospital finance consultant with a company called Stockhampton Associates that was actually based in Lake Oswego, Oregon. 
And believe huh. it or not, they were like the premier healthcare uh, revenue cycle uh, company. What, what does that mean? That means they help hospitals get paid. So hospitals don't know how to get paid. So they hire outside companies to go, to go in and show them how to do that. And okay. that company was then subsequently, it grew like a weed and got bought by Huron, which is a big healthcare consulting company out of uh, Chicago. Huh. But uh, it was fantastic. I learned all about the coding and the billing. And believe it or not, back in the 90s, they still used uh, eight and a half by 11 uh, bills. They were not electronic. Oh, I paper. bet. And um, we would go into various hospital systems and literally like pick up like potted plants. We'd find like huge stacks of bills and we'd be like, well, you got to submit these in order for them to get paid. <laughs> it was automatic, you know, so you got to submit. So anyway, we learned a ton doing that. Still wanted to go into medicine. So I went to huh. University of Illinois. I was living in Chicago at the time. So I went to University of Illinois for medical school and then internal medicine residency at Hopkins in Baltimore. I'm originally from Maryland. And I thought I wanted to be a policy wonk. I'm like, okay, I saw all these problems in healthcare. We had lots of patients calling into the hospital, confused about their bills. And I'm like, I saw a lot of patients at the bedside and they were confused as well. I'm like, okay, I could help them by, um, you know, maybe helping advise, you know, CMS, et cetera, because CMS is based in Baltimore. And, uh, but it was just too slow. And hmm. I was like, I got to do something. I got to see the fruits of my labor. So one of my consulting colleagues, Scott Shane Vogel and I, and then a third partner, we started a healthcare advocacy company called uh, Compass Professional Health Services, healthcare navigation, if you will. This was right when consumer directed health plans were starting, where co-pays were going away and people were getting these HSA cards and they would swipe the HSA card at the doctor's office or the imaging center, or whatever. And some sort of magical amount of money would come off. It was always magically right. high, right? And people were like, well, what do we, what do, we do? And so we started a company that actually provided the in-network allowed amounts. We actually provided the price transparency all the way back in 2007. And then we delivered it instead of just through a website, we actually did a whole bunch of concierge handholding so that our concierge folks, we had about 300 of them, would actually find doctors for people, give people the comparative prices, um, help them with finding lower cost prescriptions, et cetera. So it really was that adjunct tool to go along with a consumer directed health plan. We grew that to about 2000 employer clients, about 1.8 million people across the country. And then we sold that business to a light solution, which is a light solutions, which is essentially X Hewitt. So you probably remember okay. like 15 years ago when Aon bought Hewitt, well, Hewitt did a ton of HR outsourcing. They literally had 10,000 employees at Hewitt who just did all that HR outsourcing stuff. And they spun that out and it's now called a light solutions, the publicly traded company. And uh, I left in 2018 as a result of that transaction. And all I did at Compass was work with HR leaders and CFOs and CEOs all day long and, and their benefits consultants uh, about their plans. And there was still a lot of confusion and misunderstanding kind of around how the inner workings of healthcare works. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm- And there still of, is. I'm sort of independent <laughs> now. So I can make these um, healthcare finance education videos. And that's why I just started making them. And I, it has become much more um, watched than I would have ever imagined. So anyway, much more than you wanted to know, Gray, but that's, no, how, that's how we got here. It's great. And so you picked up a whiteboard one day and then you decided, hey, I'm going to use this and I'm going to start recording. Was it that simple? Uh, yes. And you can tell by the production quality of my videos that it is that simple. <laughs> right, right. So, Folks, yes, I, I very, encourage you. I, I encourage you to go onto YouTube and check it out. A Healthcare Z. It's it's great. Uh, certainly, Eric Brick, excuse me, Dr. Eric Bricker is very passionate about healthcare and looking for some solutions. And so let's get into our talk today and let's start talking about the high cost claimant root causes and and really um, start peeling it apart. I want you to help me understand a few things here. I want to talk about the rise of high cost medical claims. We're just going to get right into it, folks. From your experience, doctor, is this the chief factor in the rising cost of health care? I mean, you're, you're looking at 5% of claimants driving 50% of costs. You're going to kind of go through these um, piece by piece. Do you, what can you tell me about um, the 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 quick rise or the or the rise in these high cost um, claimants? Like, why is it happening? What are the root causes? Yep, uh, great. Thank you for asking. So, um, high healthcare costs is obviously of main you know much concern to employer sponsored health plans, and high healthcare costs are not some sort of like nebulous, hard to understand. Topic. Okay. 
And so it, it, they actually have a structure and it's fairly easy to understand. And so healthcare costs, they stratify. What does that mean? That means that they're concentrated really in the high cost claimants. And so that it's okay. sort of referred to as the 550 rule or the 80-20 rule, where 5% of the claimants drive 50% of the cost. Those costs are typically greater than $100,000 ah. in total claims over the course of the year. And then the 80-20 rule just expands a little bit, says that 80% of the costs are driven by the top 20% of claimants. And so the top 20% is typically about $50,000 uh, in, in claims cost per year per claimant. And so, so it's highly stratified. So if you want to do something about your healthcare costs, you're really not going to move the needle unless you do something about your high cost claimants. And then sure. those high cost claimants themselves are not some sort of amorphous thing all over the place. They actually um, focus generally for most employers on three diagnostic areas. And those are musculoskeletal, hmm. EV here on the slide since for cardiovascular and okay. cancer. And, um, and so I want to give you a little bit of a trick. So, you know, many of you are self-funded. If you're not, I'll just tell you right now, I highly encourage you to become self-funded right. because then you can get more access to your data. And if you look at your ICD-10 data specifically for musculoskeletal, there actually are, are categories for musculoskeletal, but not all of your musculoskeletal claims costs are actually captured in the musculoskeletal ICD-10 category. There's another category called injury and poisoning sure. that actually includes a lot of musculoskeletal claims. And these are things like joint replacements and ACL repairs and a lot of spine surgery as well. So that you, typically it's, it's osteoarthritis is the okay. underlying cause that then has these major spine surgeries and joint replacements will run 50, 100, 150 grand. That's why you're getting large claimants for these. Now, Huge. injury and poisoning, it's not necessarily an acute injury. It could be a chronic injury that happened years ago, but it'll still fall under injury. So it's not like, you know, you can't necessarily do anything about like a, a fractured leg from a skiing accident, right? And you're taking an ER and an ambulance and you're kind of taken care of. But, and then fortunately, very few employers have poisoning claims, right? That's a okay. good thing. So, right. So <laughs> we don't have employees getting poisoned all over the place. Right? I, know, I saw good. that. I was wondering. Right. So the point is, is that injury and poisoning can be a lot of chronic injuries that really is musculoskeletal stuff. So it's important okay. to lump those together. Now, the one exception here is, is that for companies that have a lot of younger employees, like millennials that are having babies, then labor and delivery might be a cost category that, um, might replace cardiovascular or cancer in the top three. Typically, uh, employer groups that have older employees, average age of an employee in America is 45, things like school systems and municipalities, uh, manufacturing tend to have older employees. Obviously, technology companies tend to have younger employees. And so there, if you've got mostly young employees, you might replace one of these cardiovascular or cancer diagnostic categories with labor and delivery. Okay, so okay. here we go. We've got high cost claimants that drive the majority of the cost, and they typically settle into these uh, diagnostic categories. Gotcha. So I'll yep. pause there, Gray. Uh, I'm getting a little long winded again. Is there, is there any? No, it's all good. I there? mean, you are the expert. And, you know, for me looking at this, you know, I start to think, again, I'm fairly new to the industry. I've only been around a couple of years. And so, you know, I start to think about how much does a certain procedure cost when you go to the hospital? And so I, it makes sense to me, cancer. I mean, it's, it's very expensive. There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, experimental drugs, for example, that are being developed. And uh, I can see the price of these things going up, but what I want to know is, you know, how did all this stuff get so expensive um, to start with? And I guess what I'm wondering is, who's responsible for that? I mean, is it those big insurance carriers, you know, the BUCAs? Um, what can you say to um, how these costs have just gone through the roof on these high yeah. cost claims? Well, especially for self-funded employers, like okay. health insurance is, you know, you're just using, you know, ASO or TPA services. So it's really sure. the employer that is, hold, right, um, that is holding the risk, right? So the definition of insurance is the transference of risk. So with the exception of the stop loss carrier, it's really the employer that's still bearing the risk. That's why it's called self-insuring, right? So the um, so really, and, th and this is something that many of you have probably already heard, but that health insurance is expensive because health care is expensive. And so that really gets us to this third bullet point here, where okay. if an employer were to break down their healthcare costs, you, they would see that 50% of their overall healthcare costs are from the actual 
um, hospital facility fees. So whenever you go into the hospital, you typically get at least two bills because the facility fee is one part. And then there's the professional fee, which is from the physician or the physical therapist themselves. So you can see that the facility fee, the hospital fee is a much larger part. Let me give you a more specific example. So on one of these spine surgeries, the facility fee from the hospital might be like 80 grand, but the professional fee from the orthopedic surgeon or the neurosurgeons themselves might only be like three or four grand. And then okay, the that's nuts. The geologist might only be like two grand. So you're talking maybe six grand in professional fees and the vast majority of it is in the facility fee. What is up and with then, that? <laughs> and so, and that's where um, the um, hospital systems in America, and we're going to go do much more of a deep dive on this. Okay. The hospital systems in America go through what is, uh, what is referred to as cross-subsidization, where those dollar amounts that I just told you, yep. that's the in-network allowed amount. In other words, their bill charges for that spine surgery might be $200,000. Okay. And then when you run that through the network, let's say there's like a 50% discount. So it would be like $100,000 that the employer would actually have to pay for the facility fee. But that $100,000 is still on average about three times more than what like Medicare would reimburse for that same spine surgery. So Medicare might only be reimbursing like 30 grand, whereas an employer would have to reimburse 90 grand. So here you are getting this 50% discount. You're like, oh, this is a fantastic deal, sure. right? And the answer is, well, even with a 50% discount, you're still paying three times more than what Medicare pays. And so what the hospital is doing is they're essentially saying, okay, well, we're getting paid so little by Medicare that we're just going to turn around and really sock it to our commercially insured members to do what's called cross-subsidize. In other words, to, to make up for what is, what is considered by them to be underpayment by Medicare then they subsequently overcharge uh, and uh, from from their commercially insured folks. So let me just pause there, see if that makes sense. No, I mean it does make sense, and I mean I maybe I shouldn't say it out loud, but it feels like that should be illegal. I mean, what's what's up with that? Is how, well, and when did this start happening? Is that, what's interesting is that um, well, of course it's it's not illegal, and, and yeah. it really is a matter of um, it is a matter of um, contracting leverage. And wow. so to a certain extent, you know, anytime we point our fingers at somebody else, we have three fingers pointing back at ourselves. And so really the big draw for these large PPO networks is that they're so large. And okay. so if it's Blue Cross United, Cigna, Aetna, or what have you, when they go to an employer, or even if it's a rented network, right, they, then that employer is going to say like, well, or they might even do a, a detailed claims analysis and they'll say like, okay, well, what percentage of our claims would be in network? And so the employers have really gone to the carriers and the networks and said, we want to have as many hospitals as possible in network. And so therefore the, the network's hands are kind of tied when they go into a negotiation discussion with the hospital system, especially a large hospital system, because the large hospital system in a particular metropolitan area whether it be Portland or Dallas or New York or Chicago, you name it, this happens nationwide. And the hospital system says, are you really going to go to your employer clients and say that you don't have hospital system X in your network? Like the employees are going to be like, you know, what gives, you know? So, right. so the, 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 the insurance carrier essentially says, okay, look, you're going to, you're going to, you know, our allowed amount that we negotiate here for the spine surgery is going to be 90 grand. And that does seem quote unquote criminal compared to Medicare, but for the sake of, of getting them in network so that they can market and sell these large networks to employers. Now, and, uh, the insurance carriers have been trying to sell quote unquote narrow networks to employers for more than a decade, for okay. close to 15, 20 years. And the employers are like, eh, we're not really interested in these narrow network products that you're offering. Hmm. And so- to a certain extent. So what, why, what my point here is, is that whenever the employer says, aha, you know, your allowed amounts aren't very good, that they just need to understand that they have essentially empowered the network 
uh, to, to make it as large as possible because that's the sort of product that they're asking for. Anyway, again, more of a detailed answer than you probably want, but that's, that's one of the root causes of that. No, you're good. And I, I want to get back to something. We talked about the self-insured world and how do they kind of get caught in the middle? Can you just kind of explain that to the listeners, how, how they get stuck? Like what's, what's your take on that? Well, I think that a, um, a self-funded employer gets caught in the middle in many ways because they have a financial responsibility ultimately for the claims, like up, up to their stop loss amount, et cetera. Yep. Um, however, they don't have necessarily as much control over the, the various um, you know, sort of levers or tools that they could use to control those costs if they hand them over completely, especially to the, the ASO. And so really from a best practices standpoint that I've really seen a couple of things happen. Either one, the employer is so large that they can basically, you know, basically, you know, Fortune 100 name, that mm -hmm. they can go to their major carrier and they could be like, we want X. And Dictate. the carrier is like, okay, we'll do it. Yep. <laughs> you know, it's like, I yep. literally had one of the largest companies in America. I was meeting with them a long time ago, like 10, 12 years ago. And they're like, look, we can go to our carrier and be like, look, we just need like 25 nurses. And our carrier will just give us 25 nurses for free. Right. Just like, look at stuff, look at claims or what have you. But for most <laughs> self-funded employers, they can't do that, right? No way. And so yeah. that's where they've historically had to go the TPA route, where it's essentially unbundled so that you can put in a variety of solutions. It could be a reference-based pricing program. It could be a, uh, a direct primary care clinic or an on-site clinic or um, virtual primary care. It could be a payment integrity uh, solution for reviewing sure. claims, what have you. So that's really where, anyway, again, long-winded answer to your question, but that's- You're where good. If an employer is going to take on the financial responsibility of being self-funded, then they really need to understand that they need to be more actively involved in managing the risks of risk of those and, claims and we'll, not passive about it. And we'll get we'll get into that in a few minutes, folks, because we've got some great ideas for you. But let's move on to the next slide. We've already okay. been talking about this stuff. Uh, we've already been talking about uh, hospital system, uh, hospital sp systems, some revenue strategies. And I do want to mention a guest. Um, chimed in and they said, don't forget that hospitals are also cost shifting to cover uninsured patients as well. They know the claims will auto adjudicate in most cases. And so I just want to throw that out there that, uh, you know, it's not all uh, fair <laughs> in love and war. And certainly when it comes to how these um, hospital systems, uh, th their revenue strategy, I, I do want to get into that. So Talk to me about this slide, uh, will you please, Dr. Bricker? Yes, and so what has happened is is that hospitals have a hospitals have a big problem, and that big okay. problem is the I'm not picking on any baby boomers here, but that big problem is baby boomers, right? Because okay. what are they doing? They're all turning 65 and getting on Medicare, right? So we all said that Medicare pays dramatically less. And so hospitals look to the future and they see that more and more of their patients and more and more of their revenue is going to be coming from a lower reimbursement level from, from Medicaid. And so what they've done is they've said, well, look, we specifically have to do, and, and listen, when the government says we're gonna pay you 30 grand for a spine surgery, the hospital basically has to say, okay, thank you very much. Like they, they, yep. they can't negotiate with Medicare. That's nope. just how it is. And so what they've said is, okay, well, we need to do some things to specifically increase our reimbursement from commercially insured um, uh, members, patients. And so this is where costs to employers have been going up in an effort to, even, to provide even more uh, cross-subsidization for those Medicare patients. And, those, and the hospitals, like they hire outside, again, I used to be one of these consultants, they hire outside consultants um, from very large, well-known, expensive consulting firms, specifically to create these strategies to increase their revenue. Remember, one person's cost is another person's revenue. So yep. the hospital systems are trying to do like whatever they can to increase their commercially insured revenue. Now, they don't call it that. Here's what they call it, payer mix. Okay. It is the mix of payers. But whenever you hear the term payer mix, what they mean is, what can we do to get more commercially insured revenue? 
and they've done a variety of strategies. I'm going to go through these here, right? So one, they've done horizontal integration. They've done mergers. Um, they've tried to do them within geographic areas. And I'll just tell you here within the, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, then we, we have something called Texas Health Resources, kind of an odd name, right? But it was a, it was a merger um, multiple decades ago of the Presbyterian system and the Methodist system. And then they subsequently merged with the Academic Medical Center, which is UT Southwestern here in town. So to a certain extent, they've been able to do local um, mergers that are horizontal across hospital systems so that when they do contract with Blue Cross United Signet Aetna, they're bigger. And so they'll say, are sure. you, look, you listen, what are you going to do? Not have us in your network? You can't do that. So it gives them more leverage when they're doing that negotiation. Now, they've also, we've also seen mergers across metropolitan areas. So the Advocate Aurora healthcare system is in the Chicagoland area and the Milwaukee, Wisconsin area. So they, and now they're attempting to now merge with the Atrium Healthcare System in Charlotte, North Carolina, as well. So now and this is all fairly new, isn't it? Mergers across metropolitan areas as well. I'm sorry. Go ahead. La this is the last 10, 20 years, last five years. How how new is this? Yeah. So the trend. Atrium one was literally within the last several weeks that that was oh, announced. Okay. But this has been but this has been going. But to your point, this has been going on for multiple decades. But it's okay. only been accelerated. It right. Has not slowed down. Okay. Well, now we'll talk to added, us about the vert. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Right. So what they've done is they've then added vertical integration. Got you. Instead, yep. instead of just hospital systems merging together, hospital systems are acquiring physician practices because healthcare costs follow a very simple formula. It is the price of an MRI or the price of an office visit or the price of a cabbage times the number of MRIs times the number of office visits times the number of cabbages, right? So it's just the unit price and then the volume, and you multiply those two together, and that's where healthcare costs come out on the other side of the equal sign. So that first one on top addresses the price, right? So they're trying to negotiate higher prices, higher mm -hmm. reimbursement at the unit level, but then they use the vertical integration to drive more patient volume through their hospital system. They buy primary care practices because when they do that, then all the referrals from those primary care physicians go into that hospital system. Those primary care docs don't then just refer all over the place anymore. They're either specifically dictated or they're highly encouraged to keep those referrals within the hospital system. And in fact, there was a physician group within the Atrium Health System in Charlotte, North Carolina, where the Atrium told that physician group, you need to refer all your patients into our hospital. And they're like, well, what if you're hospital's not like the best for my patient. They said, right. you got to do it anyway. So they left. And it was one of the few physician groups in America that actually, you know, exited from the hospital system so they could be free to refer wherever they wanted to. And then the hospitals have also bought the specialty practices as well, like the cardiologist and the oncologist. Remember, we said that cardiovascular oncology are two of the most expensive areas for employers because when the cardiologists order the stress tests, they want those stress tests to be done through their hospital. They don't want them sure. ordering them willy nilly. Likewise, when the oncologists need to infuse chemotherapy, they want those chemotherapy infusions to be done through the hospital, even if it's done on an outpatient basis. Remember, the majority of services at a hospital today are actually outpatient services. They're not inpatient yep. services. They're giant outpatient centers. And so infusion for chemotherapy at, at a hospital is much more expensive than yep. infusion that used to be done in the oncologist's office. So there you have the horizontal and the, and the vertical uh, integration. Let me pause there to see if there's any questions or comments before I hit number three. No, I, I can really get that just from working in under, other industries. I've, I've talked about it before, but I used to work in beer. And certainly you would see this all the time where the big brewers would start buying up the smaller ones and they'd buy the distributorships and they would basically, I mean, they would buy the bar if they could, right? So just trying to figure out a way to cr create that system. So it's all coming from one person or one one group. Uh, talk to me about the fee for service versus value-based care. Why is that on so, the slide? So the the quote unquote antidote to all of this uh, high cost is a term that's referred to as value-based care. Now it's important to understand that value-based care means lots of things to lots of different people. But at the end of the day, if you are a hospital system 
that price equation of the price per unit times the number of units. You want to maximize the price and maximize the number of units as much as possible. And that's traditional fee for service. So at the end of the day, value-based care, which is really a 2020s way of describing capitation, right? So in the 90s, it was called capitation. We're just going to pay you a fixed amount for a patient and you, the doctor or hospital, just need to take care of that person for that fixed amount. Hospitals do not want value-based care. Now they can't come out and say that, right? Because the, because the people that created the name value-based care, like they were like obviously in advertising, right? Because who's gonna come out and say that they don't want value, right? No one's going to be against value, right? That's like being against, you know, the American flag and apple pie, right? You're not gonna be against that. But at the end of the day, the financial engine and the CFOs within hospital systems really do not want value-based care. They want to continue and even expand fee for service because that's how they're able to generate the most revenue. All right, excellent. Is, is my volume better now? I, it was a little loud before, I apologize. No, you're good. Let's, mo let's move on to the third slide here and really get to the solutions piece. And this is why we're here today, folks. We brought in um, Katie Brandt. Heath Potter, he's here on with us all the time, and he's always got some great perspectives. But let's kind of take a look at the uh, the solutions. And so, Dr. Bricker, how do we get out of this mess? How do we bring the price of these high high cost claims down? What are some of the strategies? Okay, so I'm going to say something controversial here. Historically, uh -oh. that the way that um, the insurance uh, carriers have tried to address high cost claimants is through case management. And I will just say that, look, to a certain extent, you got to judge a tree by its fruit. And if case management has been the approach for the last 20 years and healthcare costs for high cost claimants have been going up for the past 20 years, then I'm going to say that that is not an effective way because a case management nurse calling a doctor in a hospital to tell them how to quote unquote manage their patient or to discharge them sooner, I I was a hospitalist at a community hospital in suburban Dallas. And not once did I ever have a conversation with a nurse from an insurance company that ever changed my plan of care for a patient. That's just not how it works. And in fact, one of my most complicated patients who was a woman who had, she was 44, she was a school teacher. And she had an artificial heart valve from surgery like four years before that had gotten infected. And she had to get, she had to have open heart surgery because she had to have that valve replaced or she was going to die. She was septic. She had very severe infection. And like, if there was ever a time from a case manager to call me at the hospital, that would be the time. Never got a call. So what I'm saying is, is that intervening during the, while the episode of the high cost claim is happening, that is an ineffective strategy okay. for mitigating costs for high cost claimants. And I'm going You've to posit to get today in front of it. that you either do it, but you either try to intervene beforehand yep. through primary care, or you try to clean it up on the back end through, pay, through payment integrity. But don't try to do it in the middle as is most commonly done today. So on the front end, this is yep. where probably the biggest movement for large self-funded employers in America today is they are many of them. I might even go as far as to say as the majority of them have either put in or are considering putting in on-site and near-site clinics where they are either doing it themselves or they're contracting with a company that does this. Or if they don't want to do that, they're using direct primary care, which is a subscription-based primary care doctor where you just pay them 50, 50 bucks per employee per month. And they're going to provide all the primary care for that person. There's no claims at all. Likewise, with the on-site and near-site clinic, there's no claims right? Or some of them are doing it uh, virtually through virtual primary care because to have an on-site or a near-site clinic, you have to have a geographic concentration of employees like around the clinic, right? But many employers today have their employees spread out across multiple states. And so it just doesn't make sense logistically for them to have an on-site clinic because their people are all over the place. And so there they're turning to virtual primary care. Now, the commonality across all of these is that is, it's what I said before. They are not fee for service. They are not claims based. Huh. They are typically a fixed amount, you know, and some of these places, it's like a half a million dollars a year to set up one of these things. But hey, when your healthcare spend is $20 million a year for you to invest, you know, half a million dollars 
I mean, that's one fortieth of your spend. Like you can move the needle if you invest one fortieth of your spend in upfront care. And here's why it's important. When the clinic is not fee for service, then the doctor is no longer incentivized to churn through as many patients as possible. So if a primary care physician is fee for service, they're getting maybe 80, 85 bucks a visit. Then they're incentivized to see as many patients as they right. can in a day. And that's where you get these. The national average for a primary care visit is about eight minutes. And I will tell you as an internist that eight minutes is not enough time for <laughs> any primary close. care physician <laughs> to adequately perform primary care. Listen, some people are more straightforward. Maybe you only need 10 or 15. But especially for your more complicated patients with CHF or COPD or diabetes, then like a big part of the visit is spending time with the patient and listening to what really is driving their health or their lack of health and really strategizing with them. So let me give you a specific example. Did you know that only 25% of people actually take their medications correctly? Nah. That upwards of a <laughs> third to half of medications never get filled. Right. So certainly if you come and see me, like literally being in the same room as me is not going to make you better. I got to write you a prescription. You got to fill it. You got to take the medication correctly. And that alters your biochemistry to make you feel better. Okay. So I oftentimes would have conversations with my patients around like, Hey, are you taking your medications? Hey, let me, let me review your refills here. Oh, looks like you only re refilled your medications twice in the last six months. Well, you're only getting 30 pills. So Something tells me you're not taking Do it the all math. the time. What's, what's yeah. going on? Do we need to get you a pill box? Is it too expensive? Right. Do we need to switch it to a generic medication? What's going on, right? right. And I literally, I've had conversations with patients where they would uh, admit to me, hey doc, you know what? I can't read. Okay, Can you sure. tell me you've been working for the railroad for 40 years and you can't read? Yeah, I can't read. It okay. Happens. So in other words, all the patient pamphlets that I've been giving you for the last several years, <laughs> you've just been throwing them out. Right. That's right. I'm throwing them out. Okay. That's good to know. Okay. We got to talk through that. That's going to take more than eight minutes. Okay. That type of conversation. This is a real, real guy. His first name was Jesse. Okay. That literally, Jesse, crazy sick, horrible diabetes, horrible COPD. He had stopped smoking, horrible congestive heart failure. I kept him out of the hospital for three years and I had long visits with him. Okay. So I'm, I'm not some sort of super doctor, right? I wasn't getting paid fee for service. I was on a salary. And so if you can get primary care doctors to spend more time with your patients, literally Jesse would have cost tens of thousands of dollars with multiple hospital admits, but because I could take the time with him and talk to him about the fact that he couldn't read, then I was able to prevent those hospitalizations, okay? So anyway, um, oh, by the way, even companies with gobs of money, like Apple and Microsoft and Tesla, they have on-site clinics. The vast right. majority of municipalities and school systems in Wisconsin and Indiana have hmm. on-site clinics. Why Wisconsin and Indiana? Those two states have some of the highest healthcare costs for commercially insured patients in the country. So those folks, and if you're a municipality or a school system, you can't just increase revenue, right? You got to go to the politicians and ask them to raise taxes. They yeah. don't necessarily want to do that. And that's not going to happen right? in this country. So well, the, here well, you listen. have organizations in some of the most high cost areas in America who can't just quote unquote raise revenue. And they know that one of the best ways for them to mitigate their healthcare costs is through a, a smarter use of primary care. Well, listen, let's let's do this. Uh, we are getting a little uh, short on time, and I, I do want to get into some, some of those post-payment solutions. Um, Katie Brandt's here. Um, Katie, I, I, I really want this conversation to go with um, Katie and Dr. Bricker. Heath, jump in. I know we've got a couple of questions coming through on the Q&A, but let's get into what happens when you get this huge bill and you are an employer and you just stop loss carriers looking at you like oh my god we're going to raise your rates i mean I'm, maybe i'm dumbing it down i don't know but the point is what do we do with these post payments um when it's already excuse me when it's already been been billed out uh what, what's the next step here what, what other solutions can we offer katie eric doctor <laughs> yeah i was gonna say you're testing me here gray uh it's really post care. So I love Thank you. Dr. Burke was talking about because we really need to focus a lot more on prevention 
in, okay. in spend of healthcare dollars. And I think that these alternative sites, these alternative reimbursement methodologies all are geared towards that. But once the care has been provided or once the catastrophic claim has occurred, you need to have a solution in place to address that claim. So rather than looking at a claimant over the course of a year or a person, a patient, you can also look at individual catastrophic claims and there are solutions for that. So in addition to revenue cycle enhancement, uh, the different horizontals and verticals that can be used to really maximize provider revenue, there's also a fair amount of waste on every claim. And I can tell you that I've never seen an inpatient hospital claim that didn't have errors on it. On average, there's about 10% build in error on every claim. And when you're talking about, it's easy to hit a million dollar claim these days with cardiovascular issues, with complications from surgeries, sepsis, these are long hospitalizations that can hit a million dollars very quickly. And so, you know, 10% off of that is, is really impactful to an individual payer. So it's important, I think, to look at all of this across the spectrum of pre-care or pre-service and interventions that can be deployed, you know, to kind of steer patients, to take better care of them, to spend time with them. And should a large claim occur, unfortunately it does, it's going to make up a big amount of the spend and you want to make sure that that claim is accurate and that you get rid of the waste off the top. So when we talk about a clean claim review, it's outside of an audit, it's prepayment, but post-care. And it's yet another solution to kind of have in your pocket to say, we can do a lot here to impact the overall healthcare spend. Dr. Bricker, what are your, what are your comments on this? How do you see these solutions working industry-wide? Yeah, so, so I completely agree. And I'll, I'll give you a specific concrete example. So for the uh, Quest Lab diagnostics company itself, like for their own employees, they've got about 6,000 employees. Believe it or not, they actually have a medical director that runs their health plan. So they did something, you know, kind of um, unique in that they actually took it out of uh, HR's hands. And you don't have to do that, but that's what they did. And he, and they used big national carrier and they had their data. And so he, and he had some colleagues that would help him out. They did this internally. They looked at, um, he told me once, I, I know this uh, doctor personally, and he told me about an ankle surgery that was $85,000 as an outpatient. And that just struck him as very odd that an ankle surgery would be $85,000. So they were identifying these high cost claims and then they were sending them back to their carrier. So they were identifying, you know, it's referred to as F -W, uh, FWA for fraud, waste and abuse. They were identifying these claims that looked like they had payment integrity issues and they were telling their carrier about it. Okay. And they had weekly calls with their carrier to review new high cost claimants and the status uh, or high cost claims, I should say, and the status of existing high cost claims. What, what's the resolution issue? And the carrier is great because what they can do is, is they can, if they've already paid out the claim, then they can withhold future payment on future claims to that particular hospital system. Now, um, uh, if, if you go to um, A Healthcare Z on YouTube, I made a video about this. He wrote this up in a, in a journal. So it was fantastic. So you can actually read the Quest Diagnostics um, case study in a journal where through FWA activities, they were able to take their trend. They did some other things too, but they took their trend from plus 6% per year to negative 1%. So, I mean, this in real life has worked. Yeah. Yeah, that's impressive. Um, Katie, what do you think? No, I mean, it's, it's such a great example. And I think that the, the challenging part is getting the right resources in the right places and, and having that sophistication within the plan to, to make those kinds of decisions. And so, you know, I think part of what we've been doing at Six Degrees, you know, over the recent months is trying to go on an educational campaign. You know, there are things out there that can help you. And I think, you know, all of your points, Dr. Bricker, are great. And I think, you know, this clean claim review is a yet another component of that, that if you're aware of it and you have resources to, to uh, you know, attach to it, you can really make an impact. And, you know, gosh, we just saw a claim recent months that was $28 million for an inpatient claim. Biggest one I've ever seen. I've been doing this for a really long time. And, you know, it's like, we just can't get ahead of this fast enough. We can't make an impact well enough. So we've got to deploy these programs that can, can really help and, and save all of us money. So, 
Um, and I think your example is great. And I, I love to hear about that because it, it just shows that we're all making strides towards a you know, better healthcare system. We're making a difference. I, I feel you. Thank you, Katie, for that. I see here there's some questions on Q and I really want to get to these questions. And I, I want to thank you, Katie, for bringing this stuff up because it is part of what Six Degrees Health does with our cost containment solution. So um, you'll see Heath's name pop up at the end of this episode. But for now, Heath, talk to us. What are some of the questions coming through from our audience? All right, I'm gonna try and match your guys' energy. I don't know if I can pull that off or not. It's been a, <laughs> it's been a fast one. Um, yes, sir. Okay, so we got since we got Katie talking right now, we'll hit that, and then I think the other ones are for Doctor. Okay. Parker, but um, and this question may be a derivative of the, uh, the typo on the on the screen there, but it says, when we have completed post-pay clean claim reviews, the provider cites they have built-in language to their contract that prevents audits to be performed. They balance bill the member for the reductions. How do you argue that contract language, Katie? Yeah, that's a great question and one that I get probably most of the time. So, you know, in in all of the time, the kind of decades that I've been in this space, the the hospitals have bound up payers within their audit language in their contracts. It's almost uniformly applied, and it says if you want to look at your claim, if you want to do an audit, you have to pay it first and then come on site and sit down with the medical record and confirm that everything that was given to the patient was documented in the record, was ordered, and appears wow. in that quantity on the bill. And what we said kind of a long time ago was, this isn't an audit, this is a clean claim review. And clean claim language is usually defined by state or by contract. And it says that the claim lacks defects and improprieties. Uh, what are those? Those are billing errors. And so we're saying, this is not an audit. We're sure that everything was ordered and properly documented. I'm sure Dr. Bricker, you can attest to this, hospital systems gotten really good at their documentation, specifically huh. so they can get paid. And we're saying, we're not questioning any of that. But what we're saying is, you've billed for items that appear to be duplicative, or they appear to be a nursing service, and your nurse is included in your room and board charge. Yep. Or they're billing for routine supplies like, scalpels and sutures and drapes in the operating room with a base charge of $100,000. And so what we're saying is, it appears as though you're billing some overriding charges, some inclusive charges, and then individual charges on top of them that should have necessarily been part of something else. So we look at that as a clean claim review to say, look, we're just picking out the errors. We're not being aggressive. It's about 10% per claim. And that's it. It's outside of an audit and it's outside of the confines of the medical record. So that's how we work through that. Um, you know, I think there's a, another uh, question about the book as I see here, and um, this may not address that question, but I can tell you that the bookas tend to block this when we look at a self-insured book of business, but they are deploying these clean claim reviews, these prepayment reviews on their fully insured plans. Huh. I, I know this because I've worked with all of them over the last decade. So, you know, it's important that we, you know, recognize that you can't contract your way out of being able to look at a claim and making sure it's right before you pay it. And so I've, I've not been able to find any contract language that doesn't allow you to at least take a look at the claim and eliminate the errors. That's Dr. some great Sarah, advice. Thoughts on that? Um, yep. Yeah. And I, um, I would just, I would just add that the, um, the opportunity is real. And my experience with self-funded employers is that they will, there will typically be pushback. And so it will require effort on your part to like, to push through that, whether you're the broker consultant or the employer themselves, like, you know, it, it, it's like, you, know, you should expect the first answer is going to be no. You should expect that the first answer is going to be, this is going to be hard. But, you know, just like anybody, right, just because the first answer is going to be no, just doesn't mean the second and the third answer is going to be no. You got to kind of keep working through it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's a great point because, you know, one of the things that's very important in our program is that we support those reviews after the payment is made. So we're being very transparent with the providers. We're saying, here are the errors we found on your claim. And you tell us if we're wrong, you tell us why you didn't make an error on this claim. And then we support it in those discussions. So, you know, we don't want to leave the payers who are not experts in this to kind of answer those questions. We want to have those discussions. And I think it's just 
that much more successful when you know we're handling this as the experts and following through on that and encouraging every step of the way. Don't get don't get worried about the pushback yet. The hospitals are used to this and it is the right thing to do. Yep. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, there's one other kind of related to this topic, and then there's a couple about providers that I think will be really interesting to hear from Dr. Bricker. Um, how can employer plans provide oversight and or ensure ASO TPA is performing audits prior to payment? Would you recommend any certain triggers or thresholds to ensure audits are performed? I would. I would accept that I would remove the word audit from the conversation. Ah, I, would, yes. uh, I would recommend there be thresholds for clean claim reviews, um, but that's typically driven by the payer. You know, Sometimes $25,000 in bill charges is meaningful. Sometimes it's $100,000. If it's a stop loss carrier, it might be half a million dollars. So it's setting a dollar threshold. So pretty simple. You're not looking for specific diagnosis codes. You're not looking at you know, the, the variables on the claim itself. But really, like I said, 100% of inpatient claims have errors. And so it's just setting a dollar threshold that makes sense and getting all of those claims over for review prior to making the payment. And I'd say and one Katie, other, oh yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, is it about 10%? Is that right? Typically the cost savings? It's about 10%, yes, okay. and we find in errors. And that, that can be applied within a network or in conjunction with our RBP repricing. So, okay. um, you know, I think the one other thing that we get often from our TPA partners is we can't stop this claim or we can't slow down the process. Hmm. And, Clean claim language allows you to stop the prompt pay clock. So it basically says if you're missing documentation like the itemized bill detail, you can stop that prompt pay clock until that detail is received. And on top of that, we're pretty quick in our turnaround times. So it's about five days from the time that we get it to review those high dollar claims. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Eric, um, did you want, excuse me, okay. doc, go ahead, Heath, I'm sorry. So oh, I wanted to hear Eric's opinion on this one, but how do you encourage providers to stay independent and not become hospital employees? It seems that so many docs are not equipped to deal with all the details of running a business and are navigating all the requirements for insurance companies. Uh, it's kind of hamstringing them. Yep. Uh, great question. Uh, the short answer is, is by steering more patient volume to independent doctors, because if an independent doctor is uh, busy seeing patients and making enough revenue, then they're not going to feel like their hands are tied and need to go to uh, acquisition by a large hospital system. So how can you do that? So this is actually, it was actually one of the bullet points on the previous slide. Um, in addition to primary care, specifically for specialists, this is where uh, employers are starting to do more in-network steerage within their very large PPO networks. Now, typically, the, the insurance carrier themselves cannot do the network steerage because, you know, sort of analogous to these, uh, these clauses about uh, clean uh, claims payment that Katie was describing, the, um, the hospital systems have also negotiated clauses in the contracts that say, hey, look, you know, if we're going to be in network and we're going to give you this 50% discount, then you can't steer anybody within that network. Your patients basically just have to figure it out on their own. And that's fine at the carrier level, but individual employers are like, well, look, I mean, we're, we're a plan sponsor. To a certain extent, we have a fiduciary responsibility to our plan members to steer to certain specialists within our network. Who does that? Walmart does it. So uh, Walmart literally went out to, you know, Walmart, largest employer in America, they went to their carriers and were like, hey, we want you to steer. And their carriers said, no, we can't. They're, uh, their carrier said no to Walmart. So Walmart's like, well, do it ourselves. So they went out and they got uh, their own vendor to do some analytics. And within their own plan design, they now provide cost and quality information in regards to specialists. And then they bake it into their plan design such that their employees are then financially steered to certain physicians. And you want them steered to, this gets to the independent question, is you can look at sort of the cost effectiveness of the referrals for physicians. And you can see if they're owned by a hospital system in the claims, you can pull this out of the claims with analytics. You can see if they're owned by a hospital system and if they're only referring, like if the cardiologist is only referring for stress tests to a particular hospital system where the nuclear stress test is $8,500. Shoot, you can do a, a stress test for $1,500. And so you can actually find the independent cardiologists that are not owned by a hospital system to be like, ah, if we can have our more of our members go to this independent uh, cardiology group 
that doesn't refer to that really expensive hospital system, then it's, that's a way to sort of optimize our existing network. So anyway, long-winded answer to your question, but that's how some more sophisticated employers are doing. Folks, we've got about four minutes left. I wanna make sure we have time for a proper conclusion. Anything else, Heath, that needs to be brought up right now before we end the show? Uh, well, there's a couple of questions left. I probably won't get to them all, but uh, Dr. Bricker, how does integration in quotes not qualify as a monopoly? I think the question is about yeah, you know, I, different I hospital systems too. and yeah, and the, yeah. So, so basically, the, so this is this is, a, this is a fantastic topic. Um, I just I just made a video about this on a healthcare Z um, on Monday. Essentially, not just for healthcare, but in general, enforcement of antitrust violations has dramatically changed for decades, literally going since back since the 1970s and the 1980s. The enforcement of the Sherman antitrust law and other antitrust laws has dramatically decreased huh. such that the feds really don't go after them anymore. Right. And so my, my point today, if I were to, because I know we're here towards the end, is that Employer, it's important for employers and broker consultants to understand that you can do things within your power to improve the performance of your health plan, but like the overall market is not going to change. Like if you're just sitting there waiting for things to get better, like my opinion is like things are not going to get better on their own. Like if someone's going to take your money, <laughs> if, if you if you just wait and hope that antitrust no. law is enforced better, like it's probably not going to happen. But there are things that you, there's individual agency, there's company agency, there's Absolutely. things you can do. And other employers have done this. My last point is read the company that solved healthcare by uh, John Tornis at Saragraph. He kept his health plan costs flat for nine years. It is not that complicated to do. The book's only this thick. It's incredibly <laughs> doable. Folks, take a look at that book. But before you do that, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Certainly, Dr. Eric Bricker. Um, will you come back and see us sometime? I'd love to get into some more subject matter with you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. <laughs> you bet. Um, Dr. Eric Bricker, thank you so much. Your passion is contagious. Uh, we also have Katie Brandt with us and Heath Potter. Katie's our president here at Six Degrees Health. Heath Potter is our chief growth officer. Reach out to Heath if you have any questions about some of the products and some of the solutions we offer, specifically clean claim review on that payment integrity side, that, that post, uh, that stuff that we talked about, the retroactive side. And then the last thing I wanna mention is that we do have another one of these shows coming up next month. It is in July, of course. Brokers beware if you're a broker on the call or if you're a consultant, don't fall into the trap. We have Lester J. Morales um, coming at us. Uh, next month. He is the CEO and founder of Next Impact and the creator of the Transparent Health Benefits Movement. And you can um, certainly find him on LinkedIn. You can find all of us on LinkedIn, actually. Uh, we love having you here. It is 1159 Pacific time. I do want to say thank you so much, attendees. Great questions today. You will be getting a follow-up uh, email from our team when we're all said and done, okay? Thank you. Thanks, Dr. All Bricker. right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Bye. Until the next fireside chat, folks. Take care.